cellular life and the emergence of Darwinian evolution. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jerry, and uh, also Maria and uh, Harry. Uh, so, uh, so what I'd like to do um, uh, today is, is talk about uh, some of the work we've been doing over, over the last uh, six or seven years uh, in, in trying to understand a very uh, specific part of what's really a very big question. Right? So in, in tr to really understand the origin of life, we really want, we want to know everything from how, how solar systems form, how planets form, how they develop, what happens in their atmospheres, what their geochemistry is, how the chemistry changes over time, eventually how cells emerge from that chemistry and then start to evolve and ultimately lead to uh, more complicated forms of life uh, like us. Uh, so that's you know, more than anybody individually can do. We've chosen a really small part of that puzzle to focus on, which is just the question of how, you know, assuming you have the building blocks, the chemicals, how do they start to get together and interact and start to behave in a biological fashion? And since my background is biology, to me, the most important aspect of that is Darwinian evolution. How do a bunch of molecules get together and start to show Darwinian behavior? Okay, so uh, the way that we approach that kind of problem is synthetically, we try to build structures, look at their behavior, uh, and gradually uh, build up more complicated uh, structures. And our ultimate goal is to be able to take off-the-shelf chemicals in the lab, have them self-assemble into cell-like structures, and watch them uh, evolve new functions. And so the way we think about it is sort of illustrated here schematically we, in terms of a very simple model of a primitive cell or a protocell with a, a membrane uh, boundary and some genetic materials on the inside. Okay, so before I get into those experiments in more detail, I just want to say a little bit more by way of background in terms of why I think this question of the origin of life has, has in recent years, uh, become more of a high-profile issue. I think there's been a lot more interest in it. And I think a lot of that comes from the realization over the last 10 or 20 years that life has really colonized a lot more of this planet than we used to think. Life is incredibly adaptable. Uh, I think we all know about these, these very high temperature uh, hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor where you find just abundant life under just amazing conditions. But you know, it goes sort of beyond oops, that. So a bit of a lag here. Uh, so, so here's an example of uh, Rio Tinto in, in Spain. This is a highly acidic uh, uh, river, and there are even more acidic environments on the Earth, pH down to zero. And, and there's just abundant uh, life in these environments. Uh, uh, here here you, can, you can see this green layer inside the rock. Right? Uh, so, so there are algae growing in the rock. And we know now that there, there's life kilometers down in, in pores of rocks. So life is everywhere, and it really makes you think, if life could get started almost anywhere in the universe, it would, it would start to adapt and, and colonize and, and, and spread. And, and so we know from our, from our astronomer friends now that there are a lot of planets out there. This is one of the first direct imaging uh, experiments. And so, so this is all optical noise here. The important parts are these little faint orange dots. These are planets orbiting a central uh, star. They're not Earth-like planets. And no Earth-like planets have been seen yet, but my friends tell me that within a few years, we will be detecting Earth-like planets. Within a few years after that, we'll have spectra of their atmosphere. And we all want to know, is it possible that there might be life on those other planets? If you think about a typical galaxy with 100 billion stars, there could easily be a billion Earth-like planets out there. And so there are two possibilities, right? If, if it's easy for life to get started, most of those planets are probably have been colonized by at least simple microbial life, 
This doesn't really say anything about intelligent life, but uh, you know, on, on the other hand, if it's really, really hard to get life started, if there's some bottleneck, some particular point in that process that's, that's really tough, it could be that you know, we're the only planet in our galaxy that, that has life on it, or maybe even in the whole universe. And I think this is a question which is now uh, amenable to experimental uh, investigation. We can, we can work in the lab. Uh, we, we can sort of try to reconstruct uh, plausible pathways. If we can find pathways that look pretty simple and straightforward and uh, plausible in a natural scenario, then I think that would really support the idea that life might be uh, abundant out there. Uh, if not, not. A related question that's maybe even more interesting is if there is life elsewhere, is it going to be pretty much like the life that we're familiar with, you know, based on water, uh, maybe nucleic acids to carry heritable information, allow evolution to take place, uh, maybe protein-like molecules to do most of the structural and catalytic uh, work, or could it be really, really different? Uh, so one way life could be really different is to not use water as the solvent. We know there are environments out there that have large amounts of non aqueous uh, liquid reservoirs, right? There are, there, are, uh, there are the methane, ethane lakes on Titan, an example close to home. Uh, uh, and so I think this is also something that can be looked at experimentally. And we've just made the barest beginnings of, of looking at this, but it's something that I, I look forward to uh, in the future. I think, I think the effort to design life that works in very different ways is, is a really interesting uh, intellectual challenge. Okay, so, but to come back to much more conservative uh, experiments, let me talk about uh, a simple form of life um, that is based on what we know about modern biology. And so here is a, another schematic version of the kind of structure that we're trying to build uh, in the lab. And uh, so there are two uh, main components. Um, um, just as there are in all modern cells, all, all, all modern cells have a, a membrane uh, a boundary structure, a bilayer uh, lipid membrane. Uh, and on the inside, uh, some genetic materials so that information can be coded in sequences and transmitted from generation to generation. And also, uh, so that that information uh, can generate folded molecular structures that catalyze chemical reactions and therefore do something useful to the system as a whole. Now, this is obviously incredibly simple and stripped down compared to any existing modern <coughs> biological cell, but I think it captures two of the main aspects of cellular life. Because the system is so simplified, though, so stripped down, it can only live in, a, in an environment which is correspondingly complicated. So the environment has to supply all of the building blocks. And so if we're thinking about the early Earth, this corresponds to an environment with a rich prebiotic chemistry uh, where, where the building blocks that are going to assemble into the first cells have been made in chemical processes out in the environment. And there are lots of people studying that, and I'm not really going to talk very much about that kind of prebiotic chemistry. We're just focusing on, assuming we have those molecules, how do we get them to self-assemble into structures that can replicate and evolve? Okay, um, so, uh, so the membrane-forming molecules, the building blocks for the genetic material come from the environment, along with various sources of energy, uh, mechanical energy, chemical energy, and so on. Now, one of the, the self-assembly of structures like this is actually pretty simple, and, and I'm not gonna say much about it. The tricky part, and the part that I wanna concentrate on is how a, a structure like this could grow and divide without any of the complicated biological machinery that most of us spend our, our uh, lives studying. So uh, there are two particular puzzles that needed to be solved. For the membrane uh, 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 boundary, it has to be able to grow spontaneously, uh, just based on physics and chemistry. And once it's grown, it has to divide into smaller daughter cells. Okay, so again, without any of the hugely complicated machinery that mediates cell division. Similarly, the genetic material 
has to 